So last week I did a video on who is the greatest theologian alive today, and most of you disagreed with me. Many of you disagreed with me, not everybody. But you know what irritated me is even though I said in the first 30 seconds that we weren't going to be arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom of God, Mark chapter 9, verse 34, something like that, the trap that the disciples fell into. And even though I clearly acknowledge that Jesus is the greatest theologian, uh, that is alive and ever has been, yet some of you still accused me of uh, asserting that I liked John Frame better than Jesus. In fact, one commentator uh, on the comment section, which I hardly read anymore, said, you love John Frame more than you love Jesus. And to that, I just say false, blatantly false, obviously false. The point of the discussion was simply to talk about men uh, who we can esteem as being very, very helpful in the field of Christian theology. I think I made that fairly clear at the beginning of the video. Nevertheless, uh, some of you tried to tag me with that. No, we're not talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom of God. And no, whoever I'm going to say in this video, I'm not claiming he's better than Jesus or Paul or anyone else for that matter. I'm just merely trying to start a discussion about some people who've been very, very helpful, at least to me. So anyways, whether you agree with me or not, welcome. My name is Matthew. I am one of the pastors at Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church here just north of Pittsburgh. If you'd like to come check us out, we'd be glad to meet you in real life. Don't forget our PTS, also the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh. Great place to go to seminary if you want to go to a place where you'll be trained by pastors who know their stuff. Uh, clear, reformed, confessional teaching there. It's a great place to go to get your seminary education, RPTS. So you didn't like John Frame. Okay, well, today I'm going to throw out another possibility at you. Some of you did like John Frame. I think he's been very, very helpful in my personal life, uh, in my theological development, but some of you disagreed with me. Some of you did not like the very thing that I said I did like, which was John's rather creative triperspectivalism, where he takes every theological heading and he looks at it from three particular angles. Some of you thought that was only so much theological novelty, or you thought it was confusing. Others of you are still a little bit upset about the Escondido theology controversy. It is true that John Frame, over the years, as many theologians have, uh, have come into some moments of abrasion with other writers, other thinkers, uh, sometimes even his own colleagues he disagreed with, and there was a moment where he wrote the Escondido Theology, essentially challenging some of his colleagues or former colleagues on a number of uh, topics, and it didn't go over very well. Uh, so some of you, uh, you know, you have some feelings about that. Others of you thought that John Frame was a little bit slippery in the area of the Trinity, that he maybe had some compromise in the area of divine simplicity or... Uh, maybe even fell into the idea of the subordination of the sun, the ETS controversy from a few years ago. And so you objected to John Frame for those reasons. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, let me let me throw out another possibility today just for somebody to think about. And again, we're not arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. I guess I have to make myself extraordinarily clear here. We're not talking about who we love more than Jesus. Duh, obviously. We're just discussing who in the world today who is alive on planet earth has been very very helpful to christians and especially reformed christians about thinking about topics related to theology how about this how about we discuss joel beakey today what would you think about that in fact when i posted my video on twitter i noticed um, that a number of you well, some of you liked Frame, but a number of you made a counter proposal that we consider Joel Beakey as the greatest theologian alive today. And I began to scratch my head and think about that for a moment. And I thought to myself, you know, that is a worthy suggestion. Let's think again about what our criteria were for establishing who's the greatest theologian. First of all, we said he has to be alive. So we're not talking about whether we like John Calvin better than John Owen or John Owen better than St. Augustine. Those are fun discussions, but we set those aside for a different day. We're talking about somebody who's very much alive on planet Earth today. Interestingly, many of you um, who follow my YouTube or follow my Twitter who are Catholic suggested that Ratzinger is the greatest theologian. But unfortunately, he's just moved from that qualified to unqualified status is that now he is dead. So uh, even though I would adamantly disagree with you about that anyways, he is now moved into the, the other compartment and we'll have to discuss him in the 
the all-time category as well. But Joel Beakey, very much alive. And he does also meet my other criteria. I said, if we're going to talk about the greatest theologian today, we're not just talking about um, who's the greatest preacher. We're not just talking about who's the greatest devotional writer. Those are worthy things to do as well. Um, I preach and write devotional things at times, but that's not the question. The question is theology. And so in order to qualify for the discussion, we did set one parameter that this person must have at least written a systematic theology. It can't just be a person that's focused on one doctrine like the atonement or like creation or I don't know, Christology or something. It has to be somebody who has developed a fully orbed systematic theology so that we can really analyze it from the various um, categories that are necessary in this discussion. Okay, Joel Beakey does qualify in this regard. In fact, he has a full reformed systematic theology in multiple volumes. I believe it's published by Crossway. And therein he focuses on what he calls experiential or experimental religion. Now that doesn't mean experimental, like we're mixing beakers of various glowing green liquids together. But the Puritans used to talk about experiential as meaning pertaining to the heart. And this is what I think Joel Beakey does very, very good, is like the Puritans who he's been reading for his entire life, Beakey in his theology is very much focused on application to the heart. What does this doctrine induce in you as it pertains to joy or fear or grief or guilt or duty or worship? And so Beakey in his theology is constantly trying to do what the Puritans did, which is to elicit the response of the heart. So we cannot discuss theology in a way that is remote and boring and stale. And Beakey gets that. And I appreciate that about Joel Beakey. So he certainly qualifies as one who has written a full systematic theology. Moreover, I also said in my previous video related to John Frame that if we're going to think about somebody who's truly a great, again, not Mark 9, disciples arguing about who's the greatest, but very, very edifying and helpful to the church, this person should probably also contribute in as many fields uh, of knowledge as possible, just so that there would be a fully rounded thinker in terms of uh, what they've what they've given to the church in, in order to its benefit. And I think Beaky obviously qualifies. I talked about Frame being both a theologian and a philosopher, but Beaky qualifies even more so in the sense that he has led a number of institutions, even a movement. So we can certainly chalk that up to his credit. Well, let's begin then to analyze a little bit about Beaky's contributions here. Uh, first of all, we can say this, that almost everything that Joel Beakey does is in some way related to the Puritans, okay? He said in an interview that, an interview that I was listening on a podcast that he has been reading the Puritans since he was 14 years old. He fell in love with their methods, with their content, with their doctrine, with their application, their, their steady, stout heart, experiential, experimental application. He loves that. And so practically everything Beaky does is related to quoting very often the Puritans. And that brings me to one of the most important books that I have worked through from Beaky, which is a Puritan theology a doctrine for life. I'm going to put this in a link in the description of this video so you can grab it. It's done by Joel Beakey and Mark Jones. I'm not entirely clear on who wrote which chapter. Maybe they worked on both of them uh, in synchronicity together. But man, Beakey is awesome in the realm of the Puritans. In fact, this book alone is a systematic theology. It's not his own systematic theology, but it's the systematic theology as derived from the Puritans. And so what he does as he puts out those main headings of systematics in multiple chapters across this one volume work here. Um, and then he looks at what the Puritans said about every single one of those topics. So last night I was reading to great benefit what the Puritans say about church government and about the offices of the church, because I'm about to teach on that tonight at Gospel Fellowship. But he's also got sections on what they believed about uh, revelation, about scripture, not revelation, the book, I mean, divine revelation, God revealing truth to man. Um, about Christ, about the sacraments, about eschatology. It's awesome. It's a systematic, but it's comprised in a way that draws steadily and primarily from the works of the Puritans themselves. So he's constantly talking about Goodwin and Perkins and Owen and Bunyan. Uh, he talks a little bit about Edwards there, although uh, Beakey thinks that Edwards is a Puritan untimely born because he doesn't technically fit the Puritan era. Uh, but nevertheless, Edwards is in there a little bit, not a lot. 
But Beaky is doing probably more than anyone else on planet Earth to make the Puritans accessible, except for maybe Banner of Truth. They're doing a lot in that as well. But man, uh, Reformation Heritage books, they are doing great things when it comes to the Puritans. They even released, very recently, the complete works of William Perkins. And again, I heard Beaky say in an interview that probably he and his writing assistant are the only two people alive on planet Earth that have read the entire uh, 10 volumes of William Perkins. Though maybe somebody has else done it now, but when it was coming out, they were probably the only people that had been through all of it. And so we can really thank Beaky for his love for the Puritans because they are great. They truly are fantastic. If you think of the Puritans as being dry and stale, man, you you got to get a different paradigm. You're probably just thinking about what you heard in your, your American lit class or your history class where you touched on it very briefly and then you went on to other things in American history. Actually, Puritans are English history, but you're probably thinking about Jonathan Edwards and Cotton Mather and guys like that from the colonial era. Nevertheless, Beaky has been very helpful in regards to the Puritans. Second of all, when it comes to Beaky, it's unbelievable the pace and the quantity and the volume of works he is putting out. I looked at his biography recently just to check up on it again. It says that he has written over 100 books. 100 books! How do you do that in one lifetime? I have no idea. He says he does not own a television set and he spends all of his free time writing. When he has free time, he is writing. In addition to 100 books, that just blows my mind. How can one person actually do that? I mean, how old do you have to be to even start your first book? Your 20s, maybe your 30s? And then do the pace. He's like 71 years old now and he's written 100 books. That's, that's multiple books a year. That's three books a year. Who can do that? I do think, I suspect that he works um, fairly closely with a team of writers because even as he was discussing and talking about his systematic theology in multiple volumes, I think it's four volumes, he used the word we a lot, which seems to imply that he may be just crushing through first drafts and having a team of others uh, supplement and do editing on the fly so that it really is a team project. Other than that, I don't know that it is physically possible to write 100 books. In addition to that, 2,500 articles in, in journals and magazines and posts and other such things like that. I mean, these numbers are unbelievable. When I think about some of the all-time greats, I, you know, think about Charles Spurgeon and the amount of material he was doing, his sermons, his sword in the trowel, the books he was reading, the publications that he was coming up with. Some of these guys are just unbelievable. The, even the institutions that they founded, churches and seminaries and orphanages, it's Spurgeon was an amazing wonder of, of, of history, and, and Beaky seems to kind of be in that category where it's he's almost unstoppable in the amount of pure volume that he can contribute, and everything he does is rigorously detailed, expertly cited, and richly sourced. That's very difficult writing to try to do. We're not talking about blog posts here. We're not talking about like Tim Chaley's puts out a blog post every day, which is, that's cool, that's impressive. We're talking about serious works of theology, 100 books, 2,500 articles. How can we ignore this man in the conversation? Not only that, but Beaky has constantly in front of him the idea of practicality. I mentioned this earlier under experimental or experiential religion. He is constantly thinking about the very practical aspects of the faith. For instance, some of his works are short, and so maybe that explains why he can put out 100 books. But, but take, for example, a book like this one right here, Family Worship by Joel Beakey, part of the Family Guidance series. This is a little paperback that comes in at 63 pages. And again, I'll post a link to this book in the description if you're interested. But this is so practical. This is for dad. This is for dad at the dinner table. This is for dad at the dinner table who doesn't know how to lead family devotions. And Joel Beakey is thinking about this kind of extremely practical stuff. And not only that, but Beakey even has children's books. In this regard, he's something like R.C. Sproul, who also began to delve into children's books as well. Sproul's are very creative. Uh, Beakey's are still a little bit more historic, historically oriented in, in that um, he writes about the great reformers or some of the martyrs or some of the Puritans, and then they put illustrated pictures in there. I've got a great one at home called Reformation Heroes, which we have used to great benefit in my family from time to time. 
Um, but even in his his uh, his KJV, I think it's called the Reformation Heritage Study Bible. Again, awesome resource. I'm going to link that one too because it's so good. He has a whole study Bible on the King James Version. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to put together a study Bible? It's just amazingly difficult. You think, oh, you just put the notes at the bottom. No, man. That's a serious work of theology in and of itself. And what the KJV Reformation Heritage Study Bible does so well, and you know this if you already have it, is it has the family worship discussion questions at the end of every chapter of the Bible. I've, I've never seen another study Bible do something that practical. It's really, really awesome. And so Beaky is not just thinking up here in the clouds about the Puritans and William Perkins and Thomas Goodwin all the time. He's constantly trying to bring that down into family worship and personal devotions and things like that. So his practicality is extraordinary. Now here is where it's almost like frustratingly mind-boggling. How does one man do this in one lifetime? Beaky has also started a number of institutions. And this would be different from Frame because Frame doesn't really have that under his under his uh, his belt. He, but but Beaky is an institution starter. So Reformation Heritage Books, Christian publisher, one of the best in the world in terms of Reformed theology, president of the Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary. Earlier, I mentioned RPTS Pittsburgh, Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary. This is PRTS, the Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids. Not to be confused. Sorry for the acronym soup. Sorry about that. But PRTS is an awesome seminary as well, doing amazing things, turning out great reformed pastors. I know several people that have gone there to great benefit. And not only that, but they're launching camp campuses to PRTS all over the world. So they've got them in Africa and Asia and Europe. I mean, this is a global movement that Beaky has started. As if that wasn't enough, there is the Reformed Heritage Churches, which is a denomination that is largely launched by Joel Beaky. Um, sure, they only have 12 congregations and only 2,000 members, but nevertheless, they are part of NAPARC. That's a NAPARC denomination that he that he began. And, and I can hardly believe this, he's also the, the pastor of a church. So how do you do this? Um, I, I, I just, I don't, fa I don't fathom it. Maybe you can explain this to me in the comments, how somebody can pull this off. Pastor, uh, uh, seminary president, s launching a book, a book, publication and doing all these books that he puts out every single year. Unbelievable. Amazing. And all we can do is praise God for men who are so devoted to Christ in their life. Now, a couple things about style, and then I'll sign off for this particular video. You know, I'm kind of comparing him to frame here. The men are very, very different. Obviously, they're both reformed, high view of scripture. Two differences stand out to me, though. The first is that Frame is much closer to a biblicist who is confessional, uh, but he almost never talks about historical theology. So whenever you read Frame, you're you're not going to get what Martin Luther debated about Zwingli on the Lord's Supper. That's just that's just not he's not into that. Frame does quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith relatively frequently because he subscribes to it with some exceptions. But other than that, he's not terribly interested in, um, in church history. And he doesn't bring it into his theology a lot. I think that's, by the way, part of the rub between him and some of his former colleagues about what is the value of church history and the development of the theology throughout the ages. Frame would just rather go straight to the scriptures. Fine. B key, obviously, different strength. We're not, we're not comparing saying who's better here necessarily. But Beaky obviously has grounded himself in the thinking of a particular century of godly men, i.e. the Puritans, the 1600s. Okay, So Puritanism roughly ends at the late 1600s. By the time we flip the calendar over to the 1700s or the 18th century, pretty much the Puritan movement has come to an end. Beaky has latched on to about that 100, 150 years or so, and he has made this his strength. Totally unlike John Frame. But I think it's commendable because it's very helpful. And the Puritans are so application oriented and so deep and rich in their theology and so dependably reformed and Bible believing. That's probably the best century to dig yourself into other than maybe the Reformation or the first century or whatever. Um, but the other thing, too, is in terms of style. When I read Joel Beakey, and this is not a knock, this is not a complaint, it's not a criticism or a gripe. I do not find his writing style to be as smooth as John Frame is. John Frame is a very clear, beautiful, wonderful writer. As he writes, it almost feels like it's coming across in cursive because it's just a beautiful, 
winsome, easy to read form. Beaky comes off to me a little bit more like a very well done research paper. So the style is not quite there. The beauty of language is not quite there. It's very richly sourced and well researched, but it does come off slightly more formal in his style, such that you do have to at times work a little bit harder in the brain to follow along exactly what, what he's saying. And it's not bad. He doesn't use a lot of convoluted sentences or terrible run-ons or anything like that. He certainly does not circle back and make himself repetitive so that he becomes confusing. It's a very clear and straightforward style, but it's not necessarily as artistically or aesthetically beautiful as Frame's writing is. So those two men can be compared in that way. Not only that, um, I think he's a wonderful presenter and preacher, but I would not say that preaching is, defin is, uh, is his, his definite forte. Good, excellent, highly competent, but he's not a John Piper, for instance. And of course, because nobody can be omnicompetent, nobody can be good at absolutely everything. Clearly, this man belongs in the conversation of one of the greatest theologians alive. All right, well, I mentioned a number of links that I'm going to put in the description of this video. Don't forget, too, my little book, Souls, How Jesus Saves Sinners, there it is, is available paperback, Kindle, and Audible if you want to listen to it. Again, that'll be in the, descri the description as well. Love you so much. Thanks for checking in. Talk to you later.